Well, welcome to another episode in our series, and today I'm very delighted to be talking to a distinguished scholar of European affairs. Uh, Professor Stefan Auer is Jean Monnet Chair and Associate Professor of the University of Hong Kong. His research interests include political philosophy, the comparative study of nationalism, and the various crises of the European project. Uh, he has published a wide range of books. In 2004, he came out with Liberal Nationalism in Central Europe, which was awarded uh, the following year, the prize for best book in European studies by the University Association for Contemporary European Studies, the UACES. And most recently, and most relevant to our conversation today, Professor Auer has recently published a wonderful new book titled European Disunion, Democracy, Sovereignty, and the Politics of Emergency. It came out in May with Hearst and it is widely available on both sides of the Atlantic and even in Hong Kong where Professor Auer currently teaches. Um, Professor Auer, let me get right into the, the heart of our conversation here about your new book. Um, you're interested in political philosophy and in the sort of uh, political thought that informs uh, the European Union. And you, in, in your book, you trace um, the uh, you trace the uh, the sort of the intellectual underpinnings of the European project all the way back to authors including Hans Kelsen, Carl Schmitt. Uh, would you be able to maybe elaborate a little bit uh, a little bit on that uh, history and and what is what what it was that these authors contributed to Europe? Thank you, thank you for the kind introduction. In fact, I, I trace it back even further than that. I I discuss also Immanuel Kant, and I would say that there are two strands of political philosophy that are relevant for both the construction of the European project and our understanding of it. And one can be traced back to the likes of Immanuel Kant, the Hans Kelsen, uh, or more recently, of course, uh, Jürgen Habermas. And that is a liberal tradition uh, that seeks to diffuse conflicts in politics through reliance on rules, laws, etc. But there is another tradition, I think, that is increasingly more important, and that is uh, that can be traced back to Thomas Hobbes, Machiavelli, but in my own case, primarily uh, to Carl Schmitt, and that uh, focuses on politics as conflict. In fact, the main focus, the main source of inspiration is actually Carl Schmitt, but I don't want to scare off <laughs> many of, your, of my potential readers or our uh, listeners, because uh, to be perfectly frank, Carl Schmitt was a horrible a human being, right? He basically supported uh, the Nazi takeover in, in Germany. He rightly has the reputation of being the crown jurist of Nazi Germany. So he failed in one of the biggest political challenges in his own life by supporting uh, Nazism. And yet, despite this massive misjudgment, I really believe that he was also a brilliant political thinker and he uh, it was someone who had penetrating insights into the uh, nature of the political. That was one of the key debates in interwar Germany, uh, das Politische, the nature of the political. And so there are a number of key concepts that uh, Schmidt was uh, preoccupied with that I think uh, are very relevant today, whether we like it or not. So uh, it's, uh, he, he wrote, uh, he had penetrating insights about sovereignty about uh, geopolitics, about the politics of the exception, and all these uh, key concepts, terms, uh, are, are, are very, very important uh, for us today. So we need to think with Carl Schmitt against Carl Schmitt. That is uh, my kind of motivation uh, there. We need to attempt to grasp the nature of the political. Uh, whether we like it or not, we need to talk about geopolitics. For example, the EU from its outset, from the outset, was a kind of anti schmittian anti-geopolitical uh, project. It was a response towards, uh, against the kind of hyper-politicization uh, that uh, characterized the first half of the 20th century European history that resulted in these horrible wars. 
So uh, uh, the liberal answer is kind of depoliticization, which is what Schmidt criticized, but uh, there are limits to depoliticization. And uh, the key aim of my book is actually to explore uh, the limits of the European project, the limits of the European Union. Yes, wonderful. And this is this is really one of, uh, Carl Schmidt really sits at the core of your book. And I would really encourage folks to, to um, to really get stuck in some of the historical chapters in your book, primarily the first chapter, which really covers um, everything you've just uh, described. Uh, but I want to I want to fast forward to the present, and your book makes a lot of re really interesting uh, arguments about the current state of European integration, uh, where it's at, where it's headed, um, and in in your, the foreword to your to your book, you discuss this notion of the EU failing forward, the idea that the EU can hardly move towards ever closer union unless it is being challenged by a crisis, whether that is migration or the Eurozone crisis or even the pandemic. Uh, can you briefly elaborate on this notion of fail forward? And is that really uh, how uh, scholars of EU studies like yourself are looking at the European project? Thank you. That's an excellent question because it really draws... Uh, uh, our attention, my attention, I hope our listeners' attention to the core proposition of my book. So I can be uh, very frank. The, the book is, is polemical. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, it's polemical because it's a major heresy in EU studies to question the validity of the basic proposition that has animated uh, the project, uh, but also a lot of scholarship on, on uh, uh, the EU. And that is the idea that we have to march towards an ever closer union. I mean, that is already even in the uh, Treaty of Rome, which is the founding document that created what is now the European uh, Union. So more Europe, it is often assumed, is also a better Europe. And, and the heresy that I, I pursue there is to say that that doesn't necessarily uh, follow. Uh, so there is a, a famous kind of metaphor used to, to make that argument that more uh, Europe is a better Europe or that we have to move towards an ever closer union. And the metaphor is the kind of bicycle uh, theory. Uh, the idea that European integration has to progress in order to avoid losing uh, past achievements. So just like uh, riding on a bicycle, right? You have to keep going to avoid falling over. So if I was to give a very short flippant summary of the key proposition of my book is to say, the EU is not a bicycle, right? Uh, there are challenges that Europe has been facing, particularly over the last decade, the, the crisis decade, longer than a decade, uh, that question the, the, the value of an ever closer union. So not everything that has been uh, pursued uh, resulted in, in progress, right? Not everything resulted in, in uh, not everything uh, brought about benefits to uh, European citizens. So uh, there might be some past achievements that are not all that positive and it might be worthwhile thinking about how to step back. So I'm basically not persuaded by this uh, metaphor. The key argument of my book is uh, that, uh, that uh, it is a fallacy to think that we have to pursue an ever closer union and that an ever closer union has always been a beneficial to Europeanism, and one of the most convincing arguments, I think, uh, to make that case, uh, or the most uh, lucid, I hope, illustration of that case is the, the Eurozone and the Eurozone crisis. And, and uh, uh, if, if people believe that, that uh, the Eurozone crisis is over, I, I think they are deluding themselves because uh, right now, as, as Europe is facing uh, serious economic challenges with energy crisis, etc., uh, the Eurozone uh, crisis will be uh, back. Uh, but more importantly still, even regardless of, of the current uh, state of affairs, I think the Eurozone clearly failed in its stated aims, right? Uh, I mean, I've been critical of the uh, uh, Euro uh, for, for, for a decade, and then people say, well, look, uh, I mean, it continues to exist, etc. I think that's besides the point, uh, because it's not even clear whether the fact that it continues to exist mm -hmm. is, is a good thing, right? Uh, it's key political aim, and from the outset it was primarily a political project, its key political aim was to bring the nations of Europe closer together, and it manifestly failed in achieving that, right? An increased 
uh, the tensions between Europe's uh, uh, powers in the north and, and, and major economies like Germany and, and uh, Europe's peripheries like, like Greece or, or Spain, Portugal, uh, even Italy, right? Which is not a periphery, of course, it's at the heart of, of Europe from the outset, but in terms of economic uh, difficulties that Italians uh, face, uh, we are bound to see more tensions actually emerging between uh, Germany and Italy, also uh, against the background of the elections in Italy. So the key aim of the euro uh, was to make uh, the nations of Europe, uh, to bring them closer together, it is pushing them uh, further apart. And in fact, it results in a kind of backlash, populist backlash, if you want, where, uh, as we will see in, in Italy, the most likely uh, beneficiaries of these setbacks are uh, the kind of uh, political forces that are profoundly skeptical of the uh, European project and, and might pursue uh, kind of uh, steps towards uh, uh, disintegration. So I basically challenge the basic proposition that uh, more Europe is a better Europe or that the only way forward is an ever closer union. And, and within EU studies, uh, I, I talk about this bicycle metaphor. The other kind of assumption uh, that is uh, usually taken for granted is that uh, a crisis is usually good uh, for Europe, that, uh, uh, that Europe has always thrived on crises because it has to live up uh, to the expectations that people have. And, and it is true that particularly uh, in the first few decades of European integration, I mean, uh, the EU is a response to a series of uh, crises. But I think that logic is no longer that convincing. And, and when you look at what has happened over the last decade or so, uh, there are a number of issues. I mentioned the Eurozone crisis, but we can talk about the migration crisis, even the COVID-19 pandemic. Even the response to, to the war in, in Ukraine uh, shows the limitations, the dysfunction of the EU system of governance. Yes, and... Um... Precisely on this latter point you've just mentioned and the, the effect of the war on the European engine, um, you make another really, really interesting argument in the book, which is that, you know, the EU has bounced between the politics of emergency and the politics of technocracy. Um, how, how has the war impacted this? Is, is the EU still uh, only sort of oscillating between uh, you know, emergency politics and technocratic rule? Is that still how we're uh, operating? I, I would say it's too early to say with respect to, to the, the, the war. That's very much ongoing. And that was one of the challenges I had. Basically, the, the final draft uh, was submitted before the outbreak of the war. I, I had the opportunity, I'm glad I had it, uh, to write a short author's note uh, after the outbreak of the full-on invasion of, of Ukraine. So there is a chapter edit. Uh, and I'm glad to say that I don't think that uh, the main uh, arguments that I developed in individual chapters have been challenged in any uh, way uh, with the radically new situation that Europe is facing, right? But with respect to the war, that logic, uh, uh, the switch kind of between the politics of emergency and the rule of rules or, or technocratic kind of mode of governance, uh, that is yet to uh, play out. Uh, what I discussed in, in the book uh, is uh, the mishandling, uh, particularly with the Eurozone crisis yeah, un uh, uh, under Angela Merkel. Uh, the, time and again, there were uh, dramatic decisions taken that really pushed the limits of uh, the legitimacy of the key actors. The European Central Bank, that is meant to be depoliticized, became a major uh, political actor in a sense, right? Uh, and then the national governments, including uh, the German government, took on roles that that uh, are not envisaged uh, uh, by the treaties, right? And so radical decisions were taken uh, that were on the borders of being illegal. Certainly, uh, uh, they, were, they were widely seen as illegitimate. And yet, uh, once these decisions were, were taken, uh, uh, then uh, Angela Merkel particularly did it. And, uh, rhetoric resort to, oh, well, we just need to follow uh, the rules. Never mind that the rules were just bent or, or adopted in a way uh, that, uh, that uh, questioned their, their very legitimacy. With respect to Ukraine, I don't uh, see yet a massive attempt, uh, uh, say, on, on the part of the EU Commission to, to take on uh, more powers, uh, mm -hmm. right? Uh, what I see there 
is the limitations of, of EU uh, powers. And what I see there is a problem that I discuss in the book, and, and that is becoming actually more serious, particularly in, in relation to Ukraine. And that is a problem between high expectations that the EU raises through its rhetoric mm. and the limitations of its uh, uh, real power. And I think that sadly, and again, I discuss it in the book because uh, Ukraine, the war in Ukraine is not uh, that new, right? Some people rightly remind us that the invasion did not start on, on February uh, 24th this year, but uh, it started in 2014. And I do discuss the failure of the EU uh, uh, in responding adequately uh, to to uh, the takeover of Crimea, etc. Et, et, et so the, the the key problem there that that expectation and capability gap is that uh, the EU, time and again, uh, seem to be a powerful enough actor to motivate also the people in Ukraine to 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 fight for democracy, to fight for their place in Europe, but it was not powerful enough to effectively help Ukrainians to stand up to Russia. Mm. And uh, whether it will prove uh, powerful enough now, with the help of NATO, with the help of the United States, uh, will really decide uh, the future of, of, of Europe. Yeah. Uh, so, but in terms of this uh, balancing between being just a technocratic body and 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 being uh, uh, you know uh, a, a somewhat erratic actor uh, dealing with emergencies, it is too early to say. And yet, of course, uh, Europe has not faced a more uh, serious emergency in in uh, its post-war history than uh, than uh, we face now. So the threat of a more assertive, aggressive Russia is is very serious. But yeah, the EU. If you look just at the uh, politics of sanctions, etc., then you can say, well, yes, it has maintained unity and it's awesome. And, and you know, Ursula von der Leyen visited Kiev three times. Uh, these are important symbolic actions that, that matter. But uh, the, this gap between capability and, and uh, uh, raising expectations, that happened immediately after the outbreak of the war when uh, Joseph Borrell uh, promised that the uh, EU is now going to support Ukraine even militarily. EU will export uh, weapons to Ukraine. He said, we will even uh, deliver fighter jets. And then a day after he made that announcement, he had to walk back on it and explain that the EU has no fighter uh, jets to deliver. And the member states that uh, were thinking about doing so uh, were not going to do so. And, and that still hasn't happened, right? Uh, so the EU is, is guilty of over-promising and under-delivering, a little bit less promising and more delivering. Uh, would be better for everyone, I think. Yes. Um, well, I, I want to turn to a, a very specific region within Europe that you've dedicated a lot of your uh, scholarship to, and that is Central Europe. Like I said, in, in 2004, you wrote Liberal Nationalism in, in Central Europe, which won uh, the accolade that, that I mentioned earlier by the UACES. And in this, and in this book uh, from this year, you you write about the tragedy of Central Europe, the the sort of the frustrated expectations that that a lot of the even the Western elites had of Central Europe emerging from Soviet uh, communism and embracing sort of liberal um, li liberalism, and we're seeing with uh, some of the national populist governments in countries like Poland and Hungary that that those expectations have been uh, have been uh, frustrated. Like I said. Um, one question would be, why has that not happened in your view? And the other question would be, um, you, you, you speak about liberal nationalism. You say the, the EU has to embrace liberal nationalism if it wants to resonate outside of Germany. What do you mean by that? Thank you. Again, I'm, I'm so glad you, you raised the question because, because the tragedy of uh, Central Europe uh, an, an, an important an important term to 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 my book but i i think to to europe at large Th there are two dimensions you focus more on on the uh, contemporary one but the headline itself is actually borrowed from a famous essay by a czech emigre writer milan kundera mm -hmm. and and uh, his tragedy of central europe uh, was uh, the situation after 
the suppression of the Prague Spring, right, uh, in the 1970s, where uh, a large part of Europe uh, became now uh, solidified as a part of the Soviet Empire, not the Soviet Union proper, uh, and, and the West basically accepted uh, that outcome, the division of Europe, you know, between the free liberal democratic West and 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 the communist East. And, and I was amazed to see that Olaf Scholz, the German prime minister, uh, as uh, he addressed uh, uh, an audience in Prague at Charles University, laying out his vision uh, for Europe, cited, uh, Milan Kundera cited uh, that uh, famous essay, and, and he did so to, to stress uh, the support that Germany and the EU must continue making for Ukraine so that Ukraine doesn't find itself on the wrong side of the future kind of iron uh, curtain. So that is that historical dimension that I think is important and, and, and relevant today. And, and I was gratified to see that Olaf Scholz uh, uh, made that point also. In fact, I, I wrote a short uh, editorial for uh, Politico on, on, on that. Uh, but but uh, for the more uh, recent developments, it is indeed uh, disappointing uh, for many people in Central and Eastern Europe that they still feel like uh, second-class citizens in, in, in the EU, right? They have all the EU citizen uh, rights and the freedom of movement, for example, is, is hugely popular uh, there, etc. But, but, but the problem is that the economic discrepancy uh, between uh, the West and the East has uh, persisted. And, and I have to be honest, there are no easy solutions to that, right? There are structural imbalances uh, that are very difficult to counteract against. Uh, I'm not saying like, if you look at countries that remained outside of the EU, including Ukraine, then of course they haven't done uh, uh, better than that. But I think that people in Western Europe tend to forget that simply by having those uh, instruments like uh, basically transfers, uh, you know, that they are NATO uh, uh, contributors to the EU budget and there are those that, that receive uh, support, that those transfers are not uh, sufficient to counterbalance against these structural uh, inequalities between uh, the member states. So there is no way denying that that has produced uh, some uh, resentment. I, I draw on Ivan Krasjev, one of the most incisive uh, commentator, uh, observer of, of uh, European politics, and, and he is uh, from Bulgaria, based partly in uh, Bulgaria, and, and he uh, observed how, how uh, the, 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 there is this kind of politics of imitation that, that the elites uh, in Central and Eastern Europe uh, basically try to mimic uh, the West in the hope that uh, that their countries would become uh, like the West, that that hasn't happened, uh, right? And so, uh, and that brings me to the other point that uh, uh, you kindly mentioned, uh, my monograph that is almost 20 years old now, Liberal Nationalism in Central Europe, where I argued that for liberalism to take hold in these countries, uh, it needs to be uh, combined uh, with kind of patriotic sentiment that the likes of Václav Havel, for example, the first post-communist president of Czechoslovakia, then uh, the Czech Republic represented when Václav Havel time and again, and he didn't call himself a nationalist, I would label him a liberal nationalism. He time and again uh, uh, tried to recall uh, the best aspects of the Czech or Czechoslovak tradition. Uh, a famous uh, 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 a quote by Tomasz Garek Masaryk, the founding of Czechoslovakia is Viet Czeska, that is a Czech concern, must be a universal human concern. So there you see a kind of pragmatic marriage of Czech political history, political traditions uh, that are particular to, to that nation with the universal program of the Enlightenment with uh, liberalism. And I think that is the only way to mobilize support of the people for this ambitious project of a Europe, uh, you know, that seeks to transcend uh, a nation state. So I'm uh, profoundly critical of attempts that are particularly popular in Germany, and, and Jürgen Habermas is probably the best known uh, kind of advocate of them, of a post national, post sovereign uh, Europe, because I don't think that it can appeal to, to uh, European citizens. And without the kind of popular support, uh, you will not have that kind of Europe. In fact, the result is 
that once you abandon this language of patriotism or liberal nationalism, you leave that field for less liberal nationalists who then uh, seem to benefit from that. And, and of course, the entrenched rule of uh, Viktor Orban uh, is, is symptomatic of, of that trend. And, and I discuss uh, Orban's success to uh, 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 quite in some detail in, in my book. Yes, and I, I would really, really encourage folks once they've uh, once they're done reading your most recent book to turn back to your 2004 book, which is very visionary. You you were uh, among the very first people to to call for um, liberalism to be wrapped in a nationalist sort of wrapping paper if it, if, if liberalism is to, is to strike root in in Central Europe. I want if, to if you don't mind, if you don't mind, I, I would I would probably take issue with that because it's not just like some kind of dodgy uh, packaging that there are genuine affinities right between the right kind of nationalism and and the liberal uh, uh, political program. I, I drew on on the um, Israeli philosopher Yael Tamir and, and a British uh, political theorist David Miller, who both point out that if you are serious about the major commitment that's liberal, that liberal shares, then uh, it makes sense to, to, to find roots of those in individual national uh, cultures, right, and, and traditions. So I, I don't want to criticize your choice of words, but when you say just wrapping them, then it seems like, you know, you can wrap anything in that. Uh, and nationalism is such a thing that you can wrap uh, horrible things in yeah. into that, uh, that uh, package. But uh, liberal nationalism is not as oxymoronic as it's often assumed, particularly in continental uh, Europe. Uh, the, the very expression in continental Europe would be suspect. In English, I think, uh, we are probably more at ease to talk about uh, liberal nationalism. Thanks. Well, uh, thank you for, for that really capacious answer. Uh, I want to turn to the future for our last question. I want to uh, I want to spend just a few minutes uh, delving into why you think that Europe, um, why you're somewhat pessimistic about the, the future of Europe, and you claim that um, Europe is not very democratic. And the reason for that is because there has been this excessive reliance on formal legalism. And I would like for you to dis discuss some of that, but also by populist transgressions to judicial independence, right? Uh, of the kind that you, I mean, you discussed the, po uh, the Polish case. Um, so where, where is Europe going and where should Europe go if it wants to be a more democratic set of institutions? Yes, so one, one could say that, that contemporary Europe faces two existentialist challenges. In the East, it's very clear. It's the aggressive, assertive, imperialist Russia. And mm -hmm. if it won't be stopped in Ukraine, then its ambitions will be boundless. And, and I do not want to see Europe kind of uh, existing in the shadow of Putin's Russia that prevailed against Ukraine. That is a horror uh, scenario. But Europe is also threatened uh, from within, right? Uh, the entire project is based on, on, on law. In, in many ways, Europe was made by uh, law. Legal integration is, is very important. Uh, and, and integration through law is an important strand of, of EU uh, studies. So the challenge, the internal challenge to the rule of law is also existential. But there I feel that the way in which that challenge uh, has been dealt with is clearly inadequate mm. uh, because the EU does what it always does and that is it resorts to kind of technocratic means to address what is a very political problem. Uh, so in the case of Poland, uh, which is in the headlines and, and Hungary uh, even more so, but I'll focus on, on Poland uh, what the Polish government, uh, and this is not the first Polish government that's been uh, trying to do it, what subsecutive Polish governments have tried to do is judicial reforms. And some of the aims of these judicial reforms were perfectly uh, legitimate. Uh, Poland is a post-communist country, and even though it's been more than 30 years after the collapse of communism, uh, there are structures, there are ideas, there are, uh, you know, I don't know, law faculties in Poland that still... Uh, uh, replicate the old uh, uh, logic uh, uh, that emerged uh, 
uh, during uh, uh, the communist time. So uh, th there was a need uh, for uh, judicial uh, reforms, but but uh, there is no doubt that the current Polish government uh, 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 has gone uh, beyond that and it's attempting to, to control uh, the judiciary, which is obviously a very serious threat, not just to democracy in Poland, but democracy in, in Europe too. But the solution cannot be some kind of technocratic, uh, uh, you know, uh, solution designed by the uh, European Court of Justice or, or the European Commission. The problem is primarily political and the answer therefore must be primarily political and the answer can only emerge from within uh, Poland because everything else is then uh, perceived as a foreign kind of imposition, foreign dictate, uh, that doesn't have enough legitimacy. A friend of mine, a very distinguished scholar of the rule of law, Martin Krieger, mm -hmm. who, is, who is based in, in Sydney, but he is of, of Polish origin and understands the situation in Central Europe very well, argued that uh, the, the rule of law is far too important to be left just to lawyers, mm -hmm. right? It's not just a technical kind of instrument. It is a major, major kind of political accomplishment and it therefore needs uh, a political uh, solutions right so so to my uh, polish liberal friends i i would urge them to do uh, what they can in in poland to effectively challenge uh, the conservative government uh, always uh, trying to rely on on brussels or the european court of justice uh, is likely uh, to backfire, and and what I have seen is that the uh, yeah the popularity of of the Polish uh, government, I mean, goes up and down. They are also facing serious economic challenges uh, right now, but but it tends to increase. Uh, I mean, Orban Orban in Hungary actually has really perfected uh, the way in which every every attempt to constrain his powers uh, via EU institutions via Brussels resulted in him cementing his control over over uh, uh, Hungarian polity. So I believe, and that is consistent with my uh, belief, that democracy works best at national level and, and that, that we need liberal uh, nationalism to make it work. I believe that the solutions need to be sought primarily uh, within those national polities. This is not to say that there is no role for EU institutions, that there is no role uh, for the EU, but the primarily uh, focus must be on domestic political contestation. Well, wonderful. That really brings this conversation to a close. This, this has been really a wonderful discussion on your uh, latest book. I just want to, again, remind folks of the title of it. It's called European Disunion, Democracy, Sovereignty, and the Politics of Emergency. We really encourage everyone to uh, grab a copy and get stuck in. Uh, thank you so much, Professor Auer, for your time, and, and thanks for presenting your book. Thank you for your time and thanks again for the invitation. I, I, I I'm, uh, yeah, I'm very grateful that that you chose chose the book, and invited me to this discussion. Thank you.